Hello everyone from New Jersey. East Coast represents. I'm so thrilled. Uh, my, my wonderful ladies here are from New York, as you heard a moment ago, and I'm um, so excited for this conversation today. And I'm going to kick it right off. Um, yeah, uh, in the Verge opening keynote, Apple's environmental chief, Lisa Jackson, drew on her own personal experience to delineate the tight connections between issues of racial inequity and the climate crisis. And she called on companies to re reapproach their sustainability strategies with this in mind. Now, communities, I think many companies struggle with how to do that or how to build trust in the local communities where they operate, how to engage authentically on these issues. So I'd love for each of you to start by reflecting on the most powerful example you've experienced of collaboration between your community organization and a business and what made that relationship effective, impactful, and the right, the right sort of relationship. Rob, let's start with you, please. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Heather. It's wonderful to be here with you today. Uh, so Push Buffalo is a place-based initiative uh, in the heart of the West Side community. And really, our, um, we work at the intersections of racial, economic, and environmental justice. And so one of those platforms is that we have a workforce uh, called the Hiring Hall, where we take folks that have, you know, recently, uh, recent returning citizens, we have folks that have been under or unemployed for long periods of time and upskilled them in the trades, including building renewable energy projects and green construction. And uh, we work with a partner. Uh, what we do is we provide wraparound services and hands-on training. So these trainees that went through our program were being connected to a pretty large development project downtown. And I would say that 99.9% .9 of them were folks of color. Mm -hmm. And they would come in their push hoodies. It was about 24 of them that we placed into this one site. And they were experiencing a lot of racism in particular from the white workers and folks that were from the trade unions. And um, you know, we kept working with the employer to explain to them what was happening. They took photos of you know, really terrible words that were being written on the walls, including the N-word. And uh, what we realized is that the manager, um, the site supervisor really was not sensitive to the needs and he himself was racist. So we worked with the CEO of the company and um, they ended up firing the gentleman because the workers were actually doing such tremendous work uh, they were experienced in the trades. They showed up to work on time. We provided a lot of wraparound services and soft skills training for them. Um, and really what I appreciated about that story is that the CEO understood the importance of that. And one of the things that we often say in our community is uh, when folks are looking to come work with us in our community, uh, how you enter a place is important. How you behave when you're in place is important. How you exit that relationship is also important in order to build mm -hmm. real authentic trust. Mm -hmm. Okay, Elizabeth, let's let's have some thoughts from you on this topic. Well, Heather, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be on this show with Rawa and with you. Um, well, Uprose is um, an intergenerational women of color led grassroots organization that works at the intersection of racial injustice and climate change and has been in Sunset Park, Brooklyn since 1966. So it's an old organization with deep roots. And in that time, we've doubled double the amount of open space, stop the siding, power plants, engaged in brownfield remediation. Uh, we're engaged in uh, community-based uh, planning and participatory research. Uh, building and facilitating a greenway, all of those initiatives uh, really bring uh, stakeholders together in a meaningful way. And businesses are encouraged and invited to be part of all of that decision-making planning. Um, the truth is that we've had excellent relationships with some businesses and really bad relationships with others. So with some, for example, we work to try to engage them in climate adaptation and we provide them with best practices so that they survive extreme weather events. Uh, with New York, um, with, for example, the Sims recycling facility, we worked with them from the very beginning so that it would become a carbon neutral state of the art facility that would serve our needs but not be an eyesore or polluting facility on our industrial waterfront. Uh, with Patagonia, we helped build a culture of practice, which we continue to have a relationship with them uh, to this day on how to get their, their workers meaningfully engaged in community initiatives. So there's opportunities throughout, and then there's resistance too, uh, when things like the ones that were named by Rawa become a challenge for us, which is that sometimes mm -hmm. businesses don't see themselves as part of the community and see our community as a font for wealth, 
for them, but they don't see themselves as being part or in community. We're seen as a resource and not as a partner. And, um, and they sometimes seem to have, even though they don't live in the neighborhood, more power than we do in decision making. And so we deconstruct that, we challenge that, and we build different kinds of relationships. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Great, thank you. So I want to talk about a couple of specific things that that um, each of your organizations are working on. Rawa Push has been involved with green infrastructure projects in Buffalo since I think 2013. You know, working on projects like stormwater mitigation, native plant plantings, pest management, community gardens. How has this helped create jobs for the community? Um, and as, as climate change makes infrastructure planning even more important, especially as we, we talk about a green recovery from, from our pandemic, uh, how are the efforts of this nature improving the resilience of your community? So I know that's kind of a tall order of questions, but um, that's, a, that's a big focus for you. So tell us a little bit more about what, what, how the impact is, is on your community. Sure, absolutely. So Push Buffalo is about a mile and a half away from the Niagara River. And there's huge combined sewer overflows there. And so our community for years and years has had issues with being able to fish, recreate in that water because of obviously, you know, the overflow that goes into the river. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we were under an, e- Buffalo is under an EPA consent decree to address its CSO issue because of old infrastructure. And we really saw that as an opportunity early on before they even had their long-term control plan submitted to the EPA. And so what we did is we had about 12 plots of land that we owned. We knew we weren't going to build on that. And we started to practice using all kinds of different strategies of green infrastructure from um, you know, doing native plants to rain gardens, to bioswales, to ber- permeable pavers um, and, so, and green roofs. And so we taught men or women in our neighborhood that you know, like to garden or want to get their hands dirty or just were looking for a job. And so what we're able to do with that is because we were first in line to really have these types of strategies in the region, uh, we first changed the policy. Um, the Buffalo Sewer Authority had $400 million committed all towards great infrastructure. There really aren't very many job opportunities. And also the water, the potable water and storm water should be going back into the earth. So that you know, is part of building a resilient and ad- adaptive community. And so we were able to get $90 million out of that 400 to go towards green infrastructure over the next 10 years. So then this created an opportunity for our workforce. So we started training men and women in our neighborhoods to be able to get connected to that work. And at the same time, we also negotiated the community benefits agreements, meaning that these laborers would be earning prevailing wages on these jobs. Uh, Mm -hmm. So since then, we've done hundreds and hundreds of different green infrastructure installation systems. And the great opportunity about the jobs that are created, obviously the short-term jobs are the actual, you know, building the infrastructure. And then lastly, what we do is there's operations and maintenance. So we continue to build the the workforce in that sector. Yeah, thank you. Elizabeth Uprose was at the center of a successful seven year long fight that you won last month against the rezoning of Industry City in Brooklyn. So that's a historic district focused on shipping, warehousing, manufacturing. With climate change in mind, why was Uprose opposed to the project and what's a better plan for economic uh, redevelopment, um, one that has environmental justice at the center. Well, thank you for that question. Um, Industry City was really pushing for uh, office jobs in the midst of COVID um, and the kinds of uses that are really not consistent with the needs of the community and also with what an industrial sector was created for. Uh, Ours is the last remaining and largest significant maritime industrial area in New York City. And it's uniquely positioned to be the place where we build for New York and the region's economic resilience and climate need. It's a place where we can build for climate adaptation, mitigation, and resilience. It's what we call a green reindustrialization of our industrial waterfront. And so it would have been a lost opportunity. It would, you know, it's a place that would attract 26,000 climate jobs and renewable energy energy efficiency, retrofits, construction, sustainable manufacturing, food security, the kinds of things that we really need to be planned for and operationalizing now uh, because we know that climate change is here. And in New York City, like our Sunset Park is a community of 130,000 people densely populated. Uh, We don't have the kind of real estate and open space that's available in other communities. And so the only spaces that we have to strengthen social cohesion and to build for a climate future would be our industrial waterfronts. So we're calling it uh, a frontline Green New Deal 
or the green reindustrialization of our industrial waterfront. And mm -hmm. with that, not only comes jobs, but we actually get to not only put our community on a, on a, on a course to safety, uh, but really re-incentivize the local economy. Uh, these come with um, the kinds of jobs that, um, you know, with the supply chain. And that that is a supply chain that uh, will bring in other kinds of businesses to the industrial waterfront. So it was a major victory and it was, wasn't just a victory for Sunset Park, but it's a victory for industrial communities all over the United States that are in a situation where they're either, either dealing with an extractive uh, fossil fuel economy that is hurting us or with the kind of displacement that comes from gentrification and uses that are inconsistent with an industrial future. Great. Thank you. And we've got some questions sneaking into the chat, which I'm monitoring, by the way, folks. Uh, so put them there. Um, and one of them is just how, how are you working with, um, and this is for both of you, how are you working with companies in your areas to identify some of these new technologies or new areas of focus? Like, for example, one, one, one thing that was specifically mentioned in the, uh, in the chat was heat pumps like uh, Rawa. Um, for for net zero, you know, how do you identify and work with companies to to help understand what might be good and, and where you might focus your attention, um, specifically for training? Robert, can we start on that? Sure. Uh, so I'm so glad that they raised that question. Uh, we've been practicing with uh, clean energy systems for since 2010, where we built a net zero house that um, was a renovation, was a training house, really practicing with geothermal, heat pump technology, um, and of course, rooftop solar. And so um, what we're really excited about is the technology back then wasn't so good. The heat pump mm -hmm. technology right now is actually amazing and it's getting cheaper and cheaper. So our next housing project, which is gonna be 50 units of affordable housing will be built to net zero and passive house standards. Um, they will allow for workforce opportunities for men and women in our neighborhood. But what we realized is taken us two and a half years to plan this project. And the reason for that is um, we have small boutique um, architecture firms and uh, design firms that know the you know, new technology and the understanding of that, but then the project was too big for them. And so we have a more traditional planning firm and design firm working with us. And so what we asked them to do is if they could pair up, right? These two businesses should actually be working together. So we um, set the table for the two of them to meet. They have agreed and they've been able to work together and like, hey, this is how big the project is. Be, this is um, all the new technology. Additionally, we've been doing weatherization, green efficiency services uh, since 2011, and heat pump technology and air source and ground source um, technology is part of our new green efficiency training. So we work with small um, contractors and we work with them and making sure that they're getting the training that the state and other mm -hmm. folks are offering. Yeah. Elizabeth, anything you'd like to add? I know. I think that, uh, well, just one thing that our organizations are really identifying the kinds of businesses that we need to meet the needs of an eco industrial hub. And um, there's a lot of research that's being done on what that supply chain looks like. We're working mm -hmm. with uh, agencies like NYSERDA and, um, and the New York City Economic Development Corporation to help us identify those businesses and really uh, attract, create a market instead of following a market. Right, right. And, and, and actually, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, you're both very focused locally, right? But your organizations are also part of New York Renews, which is a co coalition of 200 organizations focused, focused on the intersection of clean jobs and climate justice. So how does that affiliation help amplify your scale? Um, and how do you share resources with those other organizations? I'll start with you first on this one, Elizabeth. Well, thank you. Uh, we would not have been able to say to our community that we were fighting for uh, a climate justice future in the industrial waterfront if there had been no legislation like CLCPA. Mm -hmm. CLCPA uh, creates 150,000 climate jobs over the next 10 years. And then the Climate Mobilization Act in New York City creates another 40,000 40, jobs. And so having um, the legislation that makes it possible to move resources to communities like ours so that we can operationalize the kind of technology and the kinds of businesses that move us away from fossil fuel extraction was absolutely necessary. That's how that legislation supports a community like ours. And that's, like how, that's how that legislation is going to support communities all over the state of New York. Um, 
Um, another issue that we're really concerned about is food security in New York City. A lot of the food comes in and out through Hunts Point, and we know that as a result of Superstorm Sandy, that that was, was possibly in danger. One of the ways that we can connect the upstate community uh, with downstate and with our communities is through our water, through our maritime mm -hmm. uses. And so that's what we call a just transition and also another opportunity to strengthen social cohesion across the state, and CLCPA can help us do, do that. So it does build, it helps us build locally, but it also helps us build a scale and it helps us create the kind of regional impact that climate change really demands. We really need to right. be thinking big right. and locally. Great. Rob, a couple of thoughts on this, and then I'm going to go to a wrap up. Sure. First of all, um, it's been such a pleasure to be here with Elizabeth. She's really said a lot of it. I just also want to um, say while we do place-based work, obviously a lot of us frontline organizations, UpRose and um, Push Buffalo, for example, partner a lot. We're learning from each other um, on what is working for them, what other kinds of things can we demand. But what the CLCPA does is we no longer have to fight our municipalities, no longer have to think about where are the investments are coming for our communities to transition to a clean energy um, economy because the bill already does that. Got it, got it. So the, the closer here, what specific actions can companies take to become more authentic members of the communities in which they operate? Just a couple of thoughts from each of you, Elizabeth. Well, I think I think businesses really need to start thinking that they're part of a community of businesses and start thinking that they're part of community um, and working with us as partners um, mm -hmm. and uh, and sharing, being authentic, uh, providing information that is helpful. We believe in investing in our businesses because they're the economic backbone of our communities. Um, and we'd like to think that they think the same of us. Um, in terms of strengthening social cohesion, it's necessary for us to work mm -hmm. in a way that builds just relationships and engages us in transformation. Great. So, uh, and Rawa, just one thought from you. Yeah, one thought for me is that they, when they're first starting to plan the project, that's when they should actually invite community, communities in. We've got a lot of solutions. We've been working on these for decades. And so bring us in at the start of your project. Great. Thank you. I'm so sorry to have to cut you off. I don't want to stop. But we're going to go back to Shauna. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I'm so grateful for the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.